Yo, what's up guys? We're back for another week of breakdown and predictions. And this week we got an awesome card, man. I'm actually really looking forward to Saturday night, UFC 304. We got two title fights. We got Leon Edwards versus Bilal Muhammad. And then we got Tom Aspinall taking on Curtis Blades. Both these fights are rematches of fights that were stopped prematurely the first time that these fighters stepped in against each other. And throughout the card, there's just a lot of really good fights. There's some pivotal fights that have title implications, and I just think this is a really nice card overall. So definitely excited to break it down, excited to watch it. And I actually feel like I have some pretty good spots betting-wise and reads on this card. So I think there's going to be some money to be made on Saturday night and a profitable night. So all in all, I'm definitely ready for this fight card. And if you want access to more bets um, and just more content overall, go to patreon.com slash guru. Definitely appreciate everyone that goes over there, supports the channel, you're helping the channel, and you're potentially making yourself some money. I feel like this week, I'm pretty confident on the reads that I have, so I think we're going to be cashing, so definitely go over there, patreon.com slash guru. But besides that, man, hit the like button on this video. Let's try to get to 100 likes like always. And subscribe if you're not subscribed. Put a comment down below if you disagree with my picks or tell me what you think, what you're betting on. And tomorrow I am going to be going live with Fitz again doing final um, predictions, kind of more of a betting style stream there as opposed to this being more prediction based. So definitely check that out. But, um, yeah, man, besides that, let's get in this first fight of the night here. And kicking off the card, we got the OnlyFans Fighting Championship, Shauna Bannon, Elise Ardeline. And Shauna Bannon was undefeated. She had some hype coming into her debut against Bruno Brazil. But I feel like it was a little bit over overhype. And she took that loss in the UFC as a favorite. Now she's a big favorite again. She was going to take on Ravina Oliveira, a Brazilian girl. Um, so she has an advantage, Bannon, in terms of longer preparation time. And her opponent, Elise, has not fought in the UFC. So it's going to be her first UFC fight. She is on a win streak, but if you look at her record, her wins are against really low-level competition. So it's hard to really gauge much out of that. Um, as far as how these girls match up, I feel like on the feet, Arlene is going to be the heavier hitter, and she's aggressive. She comes forward. She'll throw some straight punches, but if Bannon is moving around, I think that she can hit and not get hit, and I think it's going to be important for Bannon to make this an MMA fight, mix in some clinches, uh, maybe get a takedown or two. I think if Bannon gets on top, she could have some finishing potential, maybe a submission or TKO prop is in play if she can get it to the ground um and I just slightly lean towards Bannon being the better overall fighter I feel like Arlene she's never beaten someone even of Bannon's level and whenever she's taken a step up she hasn't looked good so it's hard to trust her especially coming in here on relatively short notice in her UFC debut so I think that Bannon is going to be able to get this win and um I could see her getting the finish, but I'm not too bullish on how she wins. It could be a decision as well. Uh, and ultimately, it's probably a pass for me because I just don't have a lot of faith in either fighter here, and I don't think either fighter is that high level. It's just, uh, you know, one of those fights that's kicking off the card. And in the second fight of the night, Mick Parkin is going to be taking on Lucas Bresky in the heavyweight division. And Mick Parkin, one of the main training partners for Tom Aspinall, who's going to be defending his interim title in the co-main event and he's had a good start to his UFC career even though he hasn't necessarily been dominant he's 3-0 and and he's you know on his way to being in the rankings if he can get a couple more victories but they're still building him up they're giving him Lucas Bresky here who's not the greatest but I do have a little bit of a soft spot for Bresky just because his last fight, he did cash me a pretty good bet where he was able to get the upset victory over Walter Walker. Much different matchup in this one, though. And stylistically, I think this is a fight that favors Parkin. Bresky is one of these guys that comes forward hard early in the first round. He throws a lot of volume. He has um, decent hand speed. Um, 
and then he has a lot of heart, so he doesn't necessarily quit, but his cardio just is really bad. He gets super tired and very sloppy, slows down majorly. He he gets super slow. Even though he's still throwing strikes, he's still coming forward. Um, his last fight, for instance, versus Walter Walker, another thing that he does well is he will concede takedowns, but he gets back up and fights hard. And if you start to get a little bit tired, then it could just become a slot fest, and that's what the fight with uh, Walker became. This fight with Mick Parkin, I feel like Parkin is a little bit too much of a professional to lose this fight. I just think that he's going to have the hand speed advantage. And early on, maybe it'll be competitive in the stand-up, but once Bresky starts to slow down, Parkin can start to clinch him, you know, get him even more tired, um, and then just outbox him as well. I think that he has a lot better striking. He's going to be more comfortable on the feet than Walker. He's not going to be just pushing the takedowns, looking exhausted, and kind of giving bad optics for the judges. And I feel like he's going to be the fighter that looks fresher, more in control as the fight goes longer. And therefore, I think he's going to be able to take a decision. Um, I could see a late finish, but I just don't think Parkin is that much of a finisher. And in this next one, we got Sam Patterson, who's a big favorite, taking on Kiefer Crosby. And there were some questions with Patterson after his debut, and he got knocked out pretty bad. He moved up to 170 after that, had his last fight at 170, and looked really good. So I think he kind of put to bed some of those questions about him. And now he's trying to get a win and move up in the division more towards, you know, that top 15 range, even though I think he has a ways to go. And they're giving him a opponent that's a fun opponent to watch and Kiefer Crosby, but a very winnable matchup. A guy that's older, that's been around the block, you know, had a career in Bellator, um, went in out of boxing fight, and then got signed to the UFC. So his UFC career for Crosby hasn't really – it it didn't go well in his debut. And I just don't know if Crosby's UFC level at, at this point in his career. I think Patterson's a tough matchup for him. When you look at Kiefer Crosby, his style is basically just to come forward brawly. He has decent boxing, um, but hittable. And I feel like – Patterson is going to be able to catch him with straight punches, catch him coming in. And there's a big golf and advantage for Patterson in the grappling realm where I think if Patterson can get it to the ground one time or get into a dominant position, he can finish the fight. So I just feel like Patterson is the more complete fighter. He's the better fighter, um, younger fighter. And the only way that I think Patterson could really lose this fight is if he gets knocked out early, which is a possibility just because Patterson does keep his chin up a little bit too high at times and Crosby maybe could make something happen. But I feel like if Crosby can't get it done early. He's going to get tired on top of the disadvantages that he does have. And I think Patterson will be able to finish him. So ultimately, I just think Patterson is pretty much better everywhere outside of just raw power, maybe Kiefer's a little bit more physical when they're both fresh early in the fight. But I think cardio-wise, technique skill-wise, Patterson has an advantage and he's going to be able to get this finish. And I expect him to get the win via submission. So I'm going with Sam Patterson. And man, up next year, I don't know why this fight's so early on the card. I don't know if it's punishment for the way these guys have been building it up. I mean, even recently, I guess... Uh, they got into a fight outside of the uh, fighter hotel, but either way, this is a really awesome fight, and the guy that could be fighting Pantoja next for the belt could be coming out of this fight. The winner of this fight could be that guy, so definitely some big implications here. Mikhaev, we got the undefeated young fighter taking on not necessarily like a big UFC veteran. I mean, these guys probably have similar amount of UFC fights. Probably Mikhaev has more, but... Cape's been around. He's fought the best in the best in the division, and has fought all over the world. So he has that advantage in terms of experience. Twenty five total fights, as opposed to twelve for Mikhaev. But it's a really intriguing matchup as well because you look at it. Manel Cape in his UFC career has done a really good job of controlling the distance, and he has a nice sprawl. He keeps fights standing well, and then. 
he backs you up and then explodes on you and knocks you out or just kind of keeps you on the back foot and beats you up over three rounds. But we have seen outside the UFC, like when he fought Oka Sasaki, for instance, he did struggle against a guy that was jabbing, moving, staying kind of mobile against him and not standing in front of him and then shooting a lot. And once Sasaki kind of got the beat on the way that Cape was sprawling, he was able to make some adjustments and use that to get to the back or get on top. And I feel like Makayev could do a similar thing. I, I just think that Cape could potentially win the first round maybe or win you know the first few minutes of the fight where he defends a couple takedowns early. Maybe Makayev looks a little panicky, but I think that Makayev is going to find the range and start to hit a lot of takedowns, even if he can't control Cape at first, I think eventually the controls start to add up. And Manel Cape's a guy that is not necessarily the highest volume guy in general. And once he starts getting taken down a couple times, I think that's going to limit his offense quite a bit. I think that Makayev is going to be a little bit safer on the feet due to that. And I think that Makayev, you know, never been knocked out. He's going to be durable. He could take a few shots from Cape if he has to. And I trust his gas tank to be a little bit better if he could push a high wrestling pace. And ultimately, I just think Cape is going to get the or uh, Makayev is going to get the job done here. So, Mom Makayev is going to be the prediction for me. I feel like a guy that could beat Makayev is going to be someone that's going to be able to match him in the scrambling and grappling, and um, because it's going to be hard for someone to match him in that wrestling, like Alex Perez did it, but. I think there's very few guys that are going to be able to just shut down Makayev's wrestling, and I think that the pace that Makayev could push the wrestling is going to break a lot of guys that can't um, out-scramble him, like a Pantoja or someone like that, for instance. So I just think that Makayev is going to be able to break Cape with the pressure and pace, and I could see a late submission here for uh, Muhammad Makayev. And up next, we got a good scrap between Oban Elliott and Preston Parsons, and Originally, I was thinking it was a bit of a mismatch. I didn't get the line, but looked in, looking into it a little bit more, I'm still leaning with Parsons, but I do see the line's fairly close, and I think that it is a competitive fight. Oban Elliott, on the feet, he's going to be the faster guy. He's going to be a little bit sharper with his offense, but defensively, he has a lot of issues, man. He's very hittable. He's just pulling back. Um trying to pull counter but if you can close that gap on him you could touch his chin and we've seen him get dropped in multiple fights Preston Parsons he doesn't have the same kicking game as Elliot he doesn't throw the nice straight punches that Elliot does and he's hittable himself but I feel like Parsons is a little bit more defensively responsible in terms of keeping his hands high he pressures forward tries to kind of um implement his own his own game and I think that the striking is going to be close I feel like Parsons is going to be coming forward you know controlling the octagon but Elliot might be landing some clean shots and then I think Parsons is going to land some heavy you know brawling type shots and ultimately though I think it is going to come down to who has the better control or who's the better wrestler ultimately because I think both these guys are kind of Guys that have solid wrestling, but they've lacked that top control. Elliot has been a little bit better at taking the back and controlling the back, but I feel like Parsons is probably the better wrestler in this matchup. Um, so I think Parsons could probably win most of the wrestling exchanges, get on top, be the guy getting the takedowns. And I don't know if either guy's going to necessarily be able to control. So even if Elliot could... A reverse scramble get on top I think Parsons will just get back up and take him down again and that could ultimately be the difference in the fight as far as cardio goes both these guys have really good cardio so I don't think either fighter is going to slow down and I think this fight likely goes to decision honestly and I gotta go with Preston Parsons and I'm next year we have a fight I'm gonna be pretty brief on because I don't really have a strong opinion with Modestus Bukowskis and Marcin Procnio um I feel like Procneo is is the side if you're going to bet. I think it should be a, closer to a pick em. Bukowskis is probably the better conditioned guy and, you know, more solid striker over three rounds. But 
Procneo could get ahead on the numbers early, kind of squeak the first two rounds and then drop the third or even land that big uh, check hook and knock him out. And for Bukowskis, I mean, I don't know. I just don't think he's been looking the greatest in his recent fights. In this one, I think it would be it would be smart to mix it up and try to clinch Procneo, um, get him tired by putting him up against the fence and things like that on top of using your striking because I think if it's just a striking fight, I kind of feel like Procneo, even though he's awkward and maybe not as technical, he might be able to get ahead early just by throwing more offense and steal kind of the first couple rounds in that way. So I'm going to pick Procneo, but I just don't have a strong read on this fight. I don't have a really great prediction. So this one I'm going to need your guys' help on a little bit. I want to know what people listening to this video feel. Who do you guys have in this fight? Who do you think is going to win? How do you think they're going to win? And are you confident in it? So me personally, I'm going to go with Procneo by decision. But this is one of my least confident picks on this fight card. And this next one, we got Jake Hadley moving up to 135 pounds, which I think is a good move. I feel like he was one of the bigger flyweights. He had missed weight previously, and I think that 135 is going to potentially suit him a little bit better. Taking on a 1-1 one one UFC fighter, but someone that still has some hype behind him due to being a former Cage Wars world champion, having a stellar 9-1 and one record, and coming off a... Uh, his first UFC victory, so Callan Lawford is coming in here as the favorite, and he's coming in here with the momentum where Jake Hadley has back-to-back -back losses, but Adley fought Cody Durden and Charles Johnson, who are two guys that are really high level, um, two guys that would, I don't know about Durden, but I feel like they could definitely give Lawford a really good fight, and um, I think this is a close matchup. When you look at how these guys match up, Colin Lofren, um, he's going to be the better mover, and he's going to have to use that to his advantage. He's going to have to not be as willing to stay in the pocket and brawl, which he li usually likes to do. Um, I feel like Lofren, he needs to be mobile. He needs to be bouncing around, uh, trying to use angles to close the distance and land his strikes and then get out and then time the clinches push Hadley against the fence, maybe get a late takedown at the end of the round or something like that, and use that as your path to victory. Because I feel like if Lofren is standing upright, coming forward, um, staying in the pocket, I just think Hadley is going to have the firepower advantage. Even though he's coming up a weight class, I think he has the power advantage in his hands with the southpaw boxing style. I think that the body punches from Hadley are going to be readily available. And I think if he can land a lot of those body shots, he can open up the head shots on Lawfren and really start to get an advantage in the fight. Um, I do feel like Lawfren potentially could have some control time pushing Hadley against the fence. But ultimately, I don't really know if he's going to want to take down Hadley and grapple with Hadley, who's really dangerous even off of his back. I feel like if um, these guys grapple, Hadley could have the advantage there i honestly think hadley's grappling is his most dangerous asset we've seen him get some submissions we've seen him almost submit some high level guys and i think that lawford would be maybe a little bit smarter to play that standing up pushing you against a cage game rather than actually going for the takedowns um but early on i could see lawford maybe being a little bit hesitant of the power but having a speed advantage and being a little bit better but I think ultimately the line is a little bit off and I feel like Hadley could work his way into the show into the fight with with his solid pressure and boxing and if he could win the grappling exchanges I think he could win the fight so I think Lawfren is being overvalued a little bit here Hadley's I think kind of at a buy low spot where he has these two losses to good solid guys and this is a different matchup I think in this matchup he's gonna have the advantage in the boxing and I think that his pressure could ultimately kind of take over the fight as Lawford starts to settle into having to sit in the pocket and, and mix it up with them more I think that's where Hadley could get his advantage so 
I'm going to go with the upset here, and I'm going to predict Jake Hadley gets this victory. And keeping it going here, Molly McCann taking on Bruna Brazil in, in a woman's strawweight fight in this next one. And McCann has looked a little bit better since going down to 115. I feel like her last fight, she looked solid. She was um, a little bit lighter on her feet. And she was showing off a kicking game, being a little bit more fluid, which I, I thought that was a, a better addition. You know, Molly McCann in other fights had been very hook heavy you know coming forward just swinging and that works against certain opponents but when people have a takedown threat you know they could just take you down really easily when you're doing that and it's not necessarily the most technical style um but she's a big favorite here in this fight which i was a little bit surprised by i don't know why she's an almost three to one favorite against bruna brazil who i think has been fairly impressive in her last two fights she won against Shauna Bannon in an upset and then had a competitive fight with Loma Luke Boonmi, who I feel like is a pretty good fighter. So I think that Bruna Brazil is UFC level and she's going to potentially be able to prove that in this fight. And this fight's going to come down to who can control the range, honestly, because even though McCann has been getting better with her kicking game and things like that, she still has a very short reach and I don't think she's going to want to go kick for kick with Brazil, who's a really nice, proficient kicker. So she's going to have to go back to her roots in this one and try to close the distance and um, make it more of a boxing match, probably mix in some takedowns, which she's gotten a lot better at blending in her level changes and getting these takedowns, which have been... Um, it's been a good progression from her. We saw with Deanna Belbita. She took her down, submitted her, which was pretty impressive. Um, but with Bruna Brazil... It's going to be a lot more mobile fighter. It's going to be a fighter that's not necessarily coming forward and giving up that takedown easily. And Brazil is going to be looking to try to use her kicks at distance, obviously, probably chop the legs of McCann, maybe land some body kicks. And um, obviously her head kick, she's gotten finishes with that. It's it's dangerous. But she's going to be looking to land that check hook as McCann comes forward and keeps circling and try to avoid getting backed up and getting in the pocket where McCann's going to have a pretty significant advantage. Um, and Brazil could sometimes keep her chin in the air, so McCann's going to try to swarm her, back her up, and kind of just take her out, I feel like. For Bruna, she's going to be trying to stay long. And if she could do that, I think it could be a very competitive fight. And ultimately, I think Bruna Brazil should try to turn the tables on McCann like all of her opponents that have defeated her for the most part and try to mix in some takedowns. You know, Brazil does have decent clinch ability she can hit some judo throws and she trains with the fighting nerds i think that they're gonna have a good game plan cooked up for her and it's gonna be a lot closer fight than the line indicates so ultimately i just don't really see how mccann separates herself that much to be given that type of um price tag and i think that brazil's footwork could give mccann issues if mccann can't just close the distance and overwhelm her or get it to the ground, the striking could be advantage Brazil with the range. And I think Brazil could have the grappling advantage. And whoever gets on top here is probably going to be dominant if in terms of grappling. So that's going to be the fight there. But I'm just, you know, I'm going to lean with Bruno Brazil here in, in the upset just because I think the line is way off. More of a value play. If it was closer to even money, maybe I would roll with McCann. But... At this number, I think Bruno Brazil is alive under. I'm next year. Nathaniel Wood is finally getting a fight in England. If you guys remember, he's had like multiple opportunities to try to fight in England, and he's always been injured, or his opponent pulled out, or something happened. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he did. Uh, I think he actually ended up fighting in London or something. But he hasn't had that many opportunities to fight in his home country. So this is going to be another big fight for Nathaniel Wood, and they're trying to set him up here they're giving him a guy that's not looked the greatest recently in Daniel Pineda that's older that's taken a lot of damage is at over 40 fights and has also had a layoff that he's gonna have to come back from here so I think that Nathaniel Wood's in a good spot here and the line indicates that as he's a huge favorite but it is a little bit tricky I mean I think the line could be closer because Pineda isn't just damaged goods I mean the guy his last fight with Caceres, a guy that is a very solid fighter that's established himself as definitely like a top 25 level guy, Bruce Leroy. Pineda hurt him a couple times, had him in some trouble, and even though he got dominated for the majority of the fight, took a lot of damage. He hung in there, got to the decision, and um, I think Pineda's 
still tough. He has good grappling. He's going to be a lot bigger. He's going to have a you know, chance to maybe explode, get the knockout or club and sub early. But I think that Nathaniel Wood is the better fighter everywhere. He has the cardio advantage. He's younger. He's more youthful. And he needs to win here. He's coming off that loss. I still am not really sold on Nathaniel Wood as a 145-er. So that's what makes this fight a little bit tricky as well. You know, maybe Nathaniel Wood gets totally exposed here. Someone that shouldn't be in this weight class. But I think that Nathaniel Wood is going to probably be able to implement his game plan here. You know, pressure, boxing, chew up the leg of Daniel Pineda, keep the volume high, get Pineda tired, and try to take him out late or win a dominant decision. So I think Nathaniel Wood's going to do good and get the win in his home country. So Nathaniel Wood is going to be my prediction. And kicking off the main card here, we got a striker's delight between Arnold Allen and Giga Chikotse. And both these guys, you know, at one point were streaking. They were near the top of the weight class. And now they're trying to rebuild. You know, Arnold Allen, I believe he has two losses in a row now. He took the loss to Max Holloway. Then he took the loss to Mosar Evloev. Both he looked good in both losses, but couldn't get the job done. And if you look a little bit further, I mean, the win over Calvin Cater, he got the win on paper, but it was due to an injury from his opponent. So it's been quite a while since Allen has actually definitively won a fight on his own merit but he's still young he's still a high level guy with an amazing 19 and 3 record and now he's getting a fight in front of his home country so you know he's going to be pumped up and ready to go and he's going to be taking on another exceptional striker someone that came into the UFC ran off like six seven fights in a row before taking a loss and that's Giga Chikotse but Giga Chikotse is getting a little bit older at this point and there's just a lot of question marks with him man he just is not been able to stay healthy and fight recently and most of the time when you're talking about an Arnold Allen fight it's Arnold Allen that you have those question marks about in terms of the activity and it's not like Allen has been the most active guy of late either but Giga Chikotse has had injuries and kind of worse circumstances for why he hasn't been fighting um and just not been active at all recently he did get the win over Alex Caceres but didn't even look the greatest in that fight and when he fought Cater, he kind of got dominated even in the stand-up. And as far as MMA goes, I mean, Arnold Allen is a better MMA fighter when you put it all together. I think I'm not sure he can take down Allen or Chikotse or he'll try. But I honestly, I think he can if I was to make a prediction on that. And I think he could submit Chikotse with the front choke or with some sort of submission. Um, and he could have a big advantage on the ground. But if he comes out here and he and he plays a kickboxing fight, it's going to be southpaw um, from Arnold Allen, a lot of speed. And Giga Chikotse is going to be looking for that liver kick. But I feel like Allen's going to be pressuring, trying to kind of take away the kicking game and using his boxing. And I think he's going to have the better hands. I think he's going to have the better cardio as long as he doesn't just get clipped and hurt early. And he needs to not brawl with Giga. He needs to be smart, fight smart. And, and if he does fight smart, he'll mix in the takedowns and maybe even find that submission that I was talking about. If he makes it more of a stand-up only fight, it will be closer. But I just think the youthfulness and kind of where both these guys are at in their careers, I'm leaning towards Arnold Allen to get the win. He's at home as well, which helps if it's a close fight. So... Give me Arnold Allen to get this victory over Giga Chikotse. And this fight, this is an awesome matchup. Christian Leroy Duncan, Gregory Rodriguez, two unsung guys in the middleweight division that are getting a nice spot here to showcase themselves. And Gregory Rodriguez, he's the guy that's put in the work or more work. You know, he's coming off a big win over a veteran in Brad Tavares. And he's had a lot of UFC fights. He's had a lot of wins. He's had some losses. Whereas Christian Leroy Duncan, two easy victories in a row after... He lost to Armin Petrosian. Um, but this is another kind of prove it fight for Christian Leroy Duncan. If he can win this one, they're going to push him up pretty quickly, I believe. And if Gregory can turn back another one of these UFC prospects, he's probably going to be looking at a top 15 opponent for his next fight. So, pivotal fight for both these guys. And I think it's going to be an awesome fight the way that they match up. You look at Christian Leroy Duncan. He doesn't have the best hands, but he has great kicks. He has nasty elbows. He has good knees. Um, 
I don't think he's going to get taken down in this fight. I know there's some people that are kind of bringing that up. Maybe Gregory could mix in some takedowns. But I feel like Christian Leroy Duncan has great distance control. He has great ability to um, move backwards quickly. And I think that it's going to be hard for Rodriguez to close that gap and find the takedown. And I see it being more of a stand-up fight. I feel like Gregory Rodriguez really does better against guys that want to sit in the pocket and exchange with them because he has a lot of power. He's not necessarily the fastest guy. He has nice straight punches, um, but he he will get wild as well. But he does have good technique with his hands. He'll throw some hard kicks. But I feel like he's a little lumbering where he, he could struggle to close the distance. He can open himself up as he's closing the distance, and that's why he's been knocked out a couple of these times. And Christian Leroy Duncan is one of those guys that he's able to move um, – you know, be an athletic big guy and then catch you as you're coming in with a big shot and either put you out, which is what he's usually done, or potentially point fight to a decision, which I think is a lot harder with his style. Um, but neither of these guys have good records and decisions. They're both 500 when fights hit the scorecards. Um, I think that Rodriguez has a chance here if he could pressure and maybe take a couple big shots, get out of the early going and get... CLD a little tired, which I think is going to be hard because Duncan has really good cardio. But put that pressure on on Duncan, kind of take away his dynamic attacks, try to avoid elbows or um, big shots as you come in, and um, use your boxing. I feel like Rodriguez has the better boxing. Duncan can have some weird reactions at times, like he'll turn his back or kind of have weird defense and maybe Rodriguez could take advantage of that and knock him out. You know if Gregory Rodriguez can land clean, he could put out anybody. Um, and he should have a grappling advantage, but I just don't think that's going to come into play too much in this one. Ultimately, I'm going to go with Duncan. I just feel like his movement is going to be a factor in this fight. And if I'm going to be gauging this fight, you know, durability versus durability... Duncan's never been knocked out. I think he's going to be the more durable guy. We've seen Rodriguez's chin isn't the greatest. So I think that Christian Leroy Duncan's speed, movement, durability advantage, he's going to get the job done here. And I I, I could see him getting the knockout or even winning via decision. And man, this has been a tough one for me, man. I've been going back and forth on this fight. Bobby King Green taking on Patty Pimblett. And earlier in the week, I was kind of feeling, you know, the Pimblett vibes. I was thinking that. He was going to get the job done. You know, he's the young guy. He's the fighter of the UFC, wants to get the victory here more than likely. He's in his home country. But, man, some of the stuff that I've been hearing this week has been kind of throwing me off, you know, where they said that they almost pulled the fight because he was having some motivation issues, you know, some depression, mental health problems. And that's a big red flag to me man i want to see how he looks if he even makes weight everything like that even if he does make weight i'm just a little bit worried about how he's going to perform because i actually went back i watched this fight with tony ferguson and it's like in the first round he looked good i mean he was probably losing the first couple minutes but he actually showed a lot better striking you know his one twos were landing clean he was throwing a lot crisper faster strikes and it's it's easy to look fast against tony these days but he ended up hurting tony and almost finished him and i think he gassed himself out man because he got a little lucky i mean round two of that fight tony threw that kick and fell down and patty was able to kind of ride out the fight just laying on top of him for the entire round pretty much didn't do anything in the second round and uh he was totally gassed in the third so if he had a lack of motivation, he's not necessarily in the best shape for this one and gets tired, it's not going to go down the same with Bobby Green. I mean, Bobby Green's not going to slip on a head kick and just lay on his back and accept being in full guard. Um, and I just feel like Patty's not going to have a speed advantage here. Bobby's going to be the one that's faster. If Bobby's pressuring, going body, going head... He's going to be winning all the minutes in the fight. To me, it's just going to come down to is Patty going to be able to land one of those big left hooks, left kicks, or his one, two, and, um, or right hook, excuse me, right hook, right kick, or, uh, 
knock him out with some big shot that Bobby doesn't see. If he doesn't do that, I just think Bobby Green is going to run away with it. I mean, I don't see Patty being able to take down Bobby Green. I mean, I, I, I just don't see that. I didn't think his wrestling has looked that good. And so I'm going to go with Green by decision. You know, I kind of switched my tune on this one. If Patty, you know, comes in here and dominates, looks like the real deal, then maybe I'll kind of... I'm not going to say switch my stance because I feel like it's a close fight. It's just I think Green is better skills-wise. And I was kind of thinking that maybe Patty would take it just motivation, being that dog, being more hungry, and Bobby being a little bit less durable these days and maybe Patty catches him. But if Patty is not fully motivated himself, then I think Bobby's going to be able to get the win. So I'm going to go with Bobby Green for now to win via decision. And in the co-main event, we got the interim title on the line with Tom Aspinall defending the belt versus Curtis Blades. And... Honestly, man, I don't get the line. Like, I need someone to explain this to me. Like, how is Tom Aspinall such a big favorite? Like, to me, this fight should be... You know, I get Aspinall being slightly favored, maybe like minus 175-ish or something like that, ultimately, just because Curtis Blades has had a history of kind of losing in these big fights. He's been knocked out before, and Aspinall has that touch of death, and... He kind of has that it factor about him, but minus 400, like, you're going to have to explain that one to me, man, because you look at Tom Aspinall's career, it's like, I believe 13 of his 14 wins are in round one, and after round one, he's only one and two, so you're telling me that you're going to lay that type of money down on a guy that if it gets out of the first round as a losing record especially against a guy in Curtis Blades that has an insane cardio for a heavyweight. I mean, even though we've seen him get tired versus Volkov or things like that, he's had five-round fights or, like, in that fight, for he attempted, like, 30 takedowns or something. Like, he has a motor. He could go. So it's like, man, I think that's a, it's a crazy price. I think that Curtis Blades has a lot of value. You look at Curtis Blades, for me, I think early in the fight he has to try to not engage as much. I mean, I, I get someone saying, you know, close the distance right away and try to go for that takedown. Um, but Aspinall has great timing. He's going to be very fast, sharp, early. And he could just catch Blades coming in one shot. And that could be all she wrote. So I think Curtis Blades has to be smart. You know, he has to... Uses movement, uses ability that a lot of other heavyweights don't have that Aspinall has as well to move, use footwork, and try to be very defensively responsible early. Don't open up too much. If an easy opportunity to get the takedown materializes, obviously take it, but don't be so, you know, gung ho on having to get a takedown in the first round or even maybe even like the first seven, eight minutes of the fight. Let Aspinall walk you down. Let Aspinall throw his big punches. And I want to see how Aspinall reacts as the fight goes later. If the fight goes later, Blades gets a takedown. We could see, you know, a total um, kind of exposing of Aspinall's cardio and some of the other things about him, man. I mean, that's why I think he's not necessarily a foregone conclusion here. Um, Blades, to me, is the better wrestler and grappler. I understand people talking about Tom Aspinall's grappling, and if Aspinall's on top, I definitely would be worried he could get the finish, but if Curtis Blades is on top of Tom Aspinall throwing his elbows, I don't see Aspinall's jiu-jitsu being much of a factor, and I don't think Aspinall's going to be able to get back up to his feet, or if he does, I don't think he's going to be able to do it too many times. Um... It's just on the feet, there's a big gap, right? It's like Curtis Blades is going to have to figure out how to close that distance without getting clipped up. And Curtis Blades also has questionable fight IQ. And like I said, he, he seems like he kind of has a tendency to choke a little bit in these big moments. Like, he'll fail one takedown versus Sergei Pavlovich and then turn into a striker and never shoot again. And it's like certain things like that. It's just a little puzzling with Blades where it's like, 
he just doesn't show up in certain nights. So hopefully this time, you know, you have to think Blades knows in the back of his head that he's not a super marketable guy. There's not going to be too many opportunities for him to get title shots and these huge um, spots on co-main events and pay-per-view cards. So I think he's going to put it all out there. But I think that pressure could also be a detriment, man. I mean, he's also in Tom Aspinall's home country. The whole crowd's going to be booing him, going crazy. And we could see another, you know, flat, nothing performance from Blades where he just lays an egg and gets knocked out in the first round. So I honestly see this fight as a lot closer to, um, you know, a toss-up than where the line is now. And I think the line's a little bit ridiculous, like... It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I think Aspinall is getting way overhyped. Um, but having said that, I'm still going to pick him to win by first round knockout. I just don't have that conviction to go with Blaze as the underdog, man. I think he's a good value bet. Um, but as a pure prediction, I'll say Tom Aspinall wins via first round knockout. It's just... Man, I think Tom Ospinal has a lot of questions he still has to answer, and I think a lot of people are kind of crowning him a little bit too early in terms of anointing him like one of the best heavyweights of all time and all this type of stuff. And finally, we got the main event between Leon Edwards and Bilal Muhammad, and this fight's been a long time coming. Obviously, these guys have a distaste for each other, um, and Leon definitely has established himself as the champ now. You know, I, there were some questions with Leon, but... The way he won the belt, a little bit fluky, but defended it versus Camaro, kind of cemented himself the champ, then got his, not his second title defense, but his first title defense against someone not named Kamaru Usman with Colby Covington. And now he's looking to continue to build on his legacy and defeat another one of these championship caliber contenders in Bilal Muhammad, who's been on a really good streak himself, definitely earned this title shot the hard way, and doesn't have a fan base, things like that, so had to put in some extra work to earn the shot. So it's good to see Bilal get what he deserves here in this main event. Um, obviously, these two guys have fought before. The first time they fought, Leon Edwards was clearly winning the fight. The first round, he won fairly easily, and then the second round, it ended you know really quickly into round two. Um, but I do think it's a little overstated how much... Edwards was winning that fight. You watched the fight. He did land that head kick, kind of wobble Bilal. But Bilal did have a couple moments. You know, he didn't land much offense. Honestly, I will say that. Like, it wasn't really a meaningful round from either guy, honestly. I mean, Leon did get some good work off. But outside of that head kick and maybe a few other clean shots, he wasn't, like, necessarily landing super crazy volume or super crazy shots. And Bilal did have success. He was a lot stronger. You could see that in the clinch. He was able to get to the double underhooks pretty easily. He had one elbow that he did land, or maybe a couple elbows that he landed pretty decently off the break. And having seen that, I think that has to be the game plan from Bilal. That's the only way that he could win this fight to me. I think it's going to be really hard for Bilal to just time takedowns on Leon. He's just not that explosive guy. Um... And in terms of striking, I know his coach said he has hands like Canelo, but I feel like his striking is, is for championship level, it's not very good. You know, he doesn't have power in his hands. He's has good volume and pressure, and you'll throw, you know, some decent straight punches. He has the third of the takedown, so he can kind of freeze guys, then he can land over the top. But... He has big reactions to feints. He has big reactions when you land on him. I feel like we've seen in multiple fights. He's eight head kicks. He's had issues with southpaws. Um, so on the feet at range, especially, I think Bilal's going to be at a big disadvantage here, speed wise, athleticism wise. I mean, Leon is exact, exactly what Bilal struggles with, man. Tall, long, lanky southpaw with really fast, long, straight punches, nice kicks, really dangerous head kick. I think Leon's head kick is a little overrated. I mean, it's he obviously got it in the biggest moment of his career, but he doesn't have too many head kick knockouts or anything like that. It isn't like he's Mirko Krokop, but he definitely has that danger factor with the left leg. And the only way that Bilal could win to me is if he can 
really dominate in the clinch, control Leon against the clinch, you know, knee him, you know, go with that old school Marty Usman style where he was able to just foot stomp you, you know, hold you against the cage, really kind of get you tired, wear on you, mix in a couple of takedowns eventually, and, um, you know, wear, win that fight through that battle of attrition style. And Leon will let you have a chance, man, because he just is not that high volume. He's not someone that really puts his foot on the gas pedal and differentiates differentiates himself from his opponent. If he has to win or if it, he is going to win, you know, he's fine winning 48-47, you know, putting out the least amount of effort possible to get the job done and taking the least amount of risk. In this fight, hopefully which I don't think it's going to happen because there was a lot more animosity in his last fight, but hopefully, you know, all the talking will make him be a little bit more aggressive and he'll be able to let go of his offense a little bit more. But I am going to go with Leon just because I think that he's proven out at this point that his cardio is really good over five rounds, so I don't think Bilal's going to be able to drown him or get him tired. I think that Bilal's going to really struggle to land meaningful offense on the feet. He's probably going to eat a lot of shots. He might eat a couple head kicks again. And I think that... Bilal could dominate in the clinch in terms of control, maybe get some underhooks and a couple minutes of clinch control, maybe land a couple decent elbows off the break or some clinch offense. But I just think Bilal's not going to be able to get on top or get takedowns. I don't think his clinch offense is going to be overwhelming, and I think that it's not going to offset what Leon does at distance. I don't really see a finish here. I see this fight going all five rounds. Bilal, you know, extremely small finishing threat from him I feel like in this fight and for Leon he just isn't someone that goes for that kill shot even though he has kill shot dead um headshot dead excuse me but it's like um he's not really that guy in most of his fights um but I think Leon's going to take this one via decision I just think he's going to be the guy that is cleaner more tactful at distance landing more at range, being better there, and then um, also being able to nullify a lot of the wrestling threat in terms of Bilal getting it to the ground. And I think in the clinch, there's not going to be enough offense from Bilal to get the job done. So Leon Edwards, for me, it's going to be the prediction. So there you have it, guys. That's my full card breakdown and predictions for UFC 304. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you learned something. Like I said, at the offset of this video, let's try to get 100 likes. So hit that like button right now if you're listening. Definitely try to get it up there, man. Let's really, um, it's easy, it's free, you know, just click the button. It helps me a lot. And as far as um, anything else, you know, if you want to go to patreon.com slash guru, support the channel, get access to some, you know, potential uh, Uriah Faber A1 combat bets, CFFC bets, Ryzen bets, um, a couple other promotions I believe that are going down this week that have some um, odds and I'm always going to be looking, you know, potentially putting some bets down. So, Go there, check that out, Patreon or comment slash Aaron Prediction Drew. Obviously, you can have some UFC bets content with the UFC for you as well over there. And besides that, man, tomorrow we I am going to be doing my stream. I believe it's going to be 7 p.m. Pacific, Pacific time. It's going to be around there regardless. With Fitz, we're going to be doing a betting breakdown. So here I can give you my predictions. Tomorrow I'm going to give you more who I'm betting on, give you guys some free bets, give you guys some advice potentially on some trap bets or maybe some props, some things where you can make some money. So come check that out. Be vocal in the chat. Um, interactive. It always is more fun with that going on. And as far as my most confident pick in my party of the week for my most confident pick of the week, I'm going to go with Sam Patterson. And as far as the parlay of the week, I'll go with Sam Patterson, Mick Parkin, and Arnold Allen. So there you have it, guys. Thanks for watching. And I'll be back soon breaking out another UFC fight card.